Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about yet another mystery of the black holes, but this time we may have a solution to one of the biggest mysteries, how certain black holes seem to get so extremely extremely large, much larger than they should be. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. Now in the last few years we've discovered quite a lot of really interesting black holes and more specifically super and ultra massive black holes and we were obviously even able to take a very beautiful picture of one of the nearby ones, the mysterious Poehi inside the galaxy known as M87 with the actual stream right here that you see being formed by the very powerful black hole itself. But despite uh, our understanding of what usually happens around these giants and us being able to even see what happens around the uh, black hole Sagittarius A star, which is the central black hole in our own galaxy, there are still a lot of mysteries. And more specifically, we've actually discovered some black holes that are just too big, too massive. Even this right here is a little bit more massive than it should be. In terms of the actual masses, it's roughly around 6 billion masses of the Sun, which is several thousand times higher than the Sagittarius A star black hole that you see right here. Just to give you an actual visual comparison, let's take our solar system and first place the Sagittarius A star, that's our own black hole in the center, with the Sun for comparison here, so you can see how big it is. And now let's place Poehi from the M87 galaxy for which we actually have to zoom out quite a lot here because it's going to swallow pretty much most of the solar system. And although it's a little bit difficult to see its true size here, if I change the background, you'll start seeing it a little bit easier. So basically here you can kind of see the outlines of the event horizon of this tremendously large and powerful black hole. And this right here is the orbit of Neptune. But this is not even close to the largest and the most massive black hole we've discovered. There are some that are even bigger than this. About a year ago I've made a video about this beautiful black hole, Holmberg 15a, and also um, there's another older video about Ton 618. Both are considered to be some of the largest, but possibly not really the largest yet, because we're yet to discover more. These are maybe about 10 times larger than what you just saw with the Poehi black hole, meaning that they'll cover this entire area. But here's the problem we don't really understand how such a tremendously massive black hole can form. With uh, Sagittarius A star, which is somewhere right there in the center of the solar system, it's a little bit easier to explain because uh, those masses are something we do expect for uh, massive black holes to have. But this is another story. How can a black hole get so tremendously massive, especially with some other galaxies we've discovered that seem to have these black holes like this one right here, for example, much earlier in the creation of the universe. In other words, these super, super large and tremendously powerful black holes existed very early on in the creation of the universe and were already really, really massive only a few billion years after the universe came to be. So this is something that we're just having trouble explaining and we don't really know how this happened. But one of the possible solutions to how these black holes became so large and so massive comes from a recent discovery from a nearby Cipher galaxy known as M77 or Massey 77. Just like M87, this was originally discovered by the French astronomer Charles Messier, who basically classified 110 different objects using his um, by then pretty advanced telescope, all of which was done roughly around 300 years ago. So this was one of these objects, this is M77, and we refer to these objects as Cipher galaxies because essentially it's literally a quasar, it's a very very active galactic nuclei galaxy, it has a lot of energy generated in the center, the actual black hole is consuming a lot of matter and spewing out a lot of actual gas and a lot of energy, and because of this it also sometimes prevents other stars from forming. But unlike other black holes, specifically ultramassive black holes, this one is still growing 
growing and it's growing really really fast this is um, maybe about four times more massive than the one in the middle of our own galaxy but the main reason we call these galaxies Cipher galaxies and not quasars is because in Cipher galaxies we actually also see the galactic shapes as well we see the arms we see the star formations and globular clusters so basically a typical quasar is just an extremely bright and powerful shape and usually we're actually seeing the emissions we don't really see the galactic shapes but when these emissions happen a lot closer to us and especially if they're not really pointing directly at us we then refer to these galaxies as Cipher galaxies and so one of the first described Cipher galaxies was the beautiful galaxy M77 that's about the same distance away from us as M87 so just a little bit closer actually it's 47 million light years away from us but because it's a Cipher galaxy it's actually really interesting to us because it allows us to study these unusual quasars by studying something that's relatively close to us and the most important part about this galaxy is that it seems to be a somewhat inactive quasar in other words it's not super active just yet even though it's already throwing out a lot of gas at something like 500 kilometers per second but there is still star formation happening here so it's not super active but by studying this unusual black hole in a little bit more detail and by looking at it using radio waves because basically the black hole itself is covered by the gas so you can't really see it in visual light the scientists behind this paper right here discovered a potential reason explaining how so many different black holes grow so big so quick. When they looked at the center of this galaxy in a little bit more detail, they realized that first of all, obviously like so many other black holes, it has um, an actual accretion disk and a lot of other material roughly up to about four light years away from the black hole orbits in one direction. But to their surprise, once they looked at the distance from 4 to 22 light years, they discovered that the actual disk was orbiting in a completely other direction. In other words, the closest disk was orbiting this way, but the farther disk was orbiting the other way. And this gave the scientists a really good explanation for how one day this black hole is going to turn really massive as well. At some point, the two disks that are orbiting in completely opposite directions will very likely start sort of colliding with one another and all of the particles as they collide will lose all the velocity and eventually start slowly falling into the black hole making it grow in size and essentially increasing the actual power of the black hole turning it into a very powerful quasar or very powerful cipher galaxy so all of this matter as it sort of combines with the black hole will very likely add a tremendous amount of mass turning it into one of the biggest black holes in the vicinity and because these scientists were able to find at least one example of this rotation and counter rotation disk inside of a uh, typical galaxy it's very likely that these examples exist pretty much everywhere across the universe and this is actually a very solid explanation to how a typical black hole grows in size and in mass suddenly and dramatically this is actually a very good explanation and technically is the best explanation we have right now for how so many massive and extremely large black holes seem to exist early on in the existence of the universe but i guess the next question is so how exactly did this galaxy acquire a disk that spins in one way and another disk that spins in the opposite way how is that even possible because technically these counter rotations have only been detected at much larger distances away from galaxies and normally these are formed when a galaxy collides with another galaxy and inside of these galaxies it's very common to find very unusual motion that's otherwise hard to find in a typical galaxy so if this is what happened here as well it must have been a collision that happened between a large spiral galaxy like m77 and some sort of a smaller galaxy uh, very likely similar to for example our own satellite galaxy Magellanic Cloud that will also one day collide with the Milky Way now here if we try to simulate this you'll notice that um, the collision might not actually create these uh, similar effects but as you can see the actual smaller galaxy gets absorbed inside the center of the galaxy and there it could technically create this unusual accretion disk that we observed which is exactly what the scientists observed in M77. So this uh, observation does kind of provide at least one explanation for the mystery of the so-called ultra-massive black holes existing very early in the universe. But it doesn't really tell us how all of this happened. I mean, galactic collision is one way, 
there's maybe something else that happened that caused this particular galaxy to have these two unusually shaped disks um, that we've observed but it also might have created a completely new mystery as well. For now, the best thing that we can do is actually to keep looking at new galaxies and try to see if we can find these particular effects somewhere else out there, which would definitely suggest that this is a common phenomenon that does happen in many different galaxies. And it would also explain how these tremendously massive black holes can form so quickly and with such tremendous ferocity. Now, what's interesting is that, obviously, this also suggests to us that, at some point, our neighbor M77 is going to become really, really powerful. Now, will this have any effect on the Milky Way, specifically on planet Earth? That we don't really know. Right now, it's still quite powerful, but not powerful enough for us to actually feel any effects from it. But if this quasar becomes really, really, really strong, and if the astrophysical jet starts pointing at us, that could be a problem. The mass extinction type of a problem. Because a typical quasar and the astrophysical jets produced by these quasars, if pointing at a certain planet, could totally strip that planet of atmosphere and destroy any life on that planet. Now, the chance of that happening is actually pretty low, but it's always there. Anyway, it's not going to happen anytime soon though, and it will probably take a few thousand years before we reach the point where M77 does become quite active, but we're talking thousands of years, not millions and not billions. Humanity might still be around, and if so, we need to be ready if it decides to point in our direction. Now, it's very unlikely, but you never know. Anyway, on that note, once we learn more about this unusual phenomenon and discover why exactly M77 has such an unusual disk that orbits in a different direction, we'll come back and talk about this more. Until then, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe consider supporting this channel on Patreon because it does help me quite a lot, and maybe consider purchasing this beautiful t-shirt I'm wearing that might help you feel wonderful as well. Anyway, on that note, I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, space out, and as always, bye-bye.